my name is Claiborne Woodall. I work for the Department of Conservation and Recreation and within DCR, the Natural Heritage Program. Uh, you're probably most familiar with DCR in that uh, our sister division, the Division of State Parks, manages the state park system. Uh, uh, state parks is far and away the largest division at DCR. Alongside state parks is the Natural Heritage Division, Division of Soil and Water Conservation, the Division of Dam Safety, Chesapeake Bay Local Assistance, and several other programs. Um, I manage state natural areas in Southwest Virginia. I also serve as the Western Fire Manager for implementing, uh, administrating the fire program in Western Virginia. And just to, we'll get too deep in, into the weeds here, but I work for the Virginia Natural Heritage Program and all 50 states, most of Latin America and much of South America have natural heritage programs. These programs were launched um, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Um, often they're within state government, although some are within universities. Tennessee Valley Authority has its own natural heritage program. But the, the, the power and the point being that um, all of these heritage programs share the same methodology. So when we say that, uh, that a certain species or community is rare, that's not just based on uh, our geographic boundaries of Virginia, but that's data that's lumped into the whole Western hemisphere. And that data is used for all sorts of things, project review and conservation planning, trying to identify the most significant places to protect. Um, it's used from everything from uh, transmission and gas line right of way placements to roads and, and all sorts of all sorts of practical everyday uses. We're a non regulatory agency, I should also add. Um, Virginia's regulatory agency is the Department of Environmental Quality, and they uh, enforce the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and so forth. Uh, that, this was a staff photograph from a couple of years ago right before COVID, I think this was uh, December of 1990, or, uh, 2019. Staff has grown quite a bit since I first started. I've been working for Natural Heritage for 24 years. Um, in 1989, uh, the Natural Area Preserves Act was codified in the Code of Virginia to establish a statewide system of natural area preserves. Um, so it's a relatively young system, you know, as compared to the state park system. Uh, it authorized a legal instrument, the deed of dedication to protect natural area preserves in perpetuity. It, and importantly, it defines what natural heritage resources are. It's the habitat of rare, threatened, or endangered plant and animal species, uh, rare state or significant natural communities, or geologic sites, i.e. the channels got in on that caveat right there, um, and stipulates that the preserves are to be managed in a manner consistent with the continued preservation of the resources that they support. So it's different than state parks. Um, parks are primarily managed for, and rightfully so, for public recreation. The preserve system are managed for um, rare species conservation and secondarily um, public access where appropriate. So here's an interesting map here, just the significance of Southwest Virginia and where we are. Um, this is a, a weighted uh, richness model of critically imperiled and imperiled species in the United States. And you can see how hot Southwest Virginia, Northeast Tennessee uh, shows up on this map. A more, a more re that's from 2013, uh, interesting recent, uh, as of 2020, a new map was done showing uh, hot spots of um, imperiled species. And in Virginia, this map here is a little bit dated, but this is uh, these dots represent rare plant, animal, and natural community um, locations across the Commonwealth. And in Southwest Virginia, you can clearly see the animals being mostly aquatic organisms in the Powell River, the Clinch River, 
and the North Fork, South, uh, Middle Fork and South Fork of the Holston Rivers. Those, those river systems show right up there. Um, it's interesting here how uh, the less density of lower density of rare species in central Virginia. And there's good reason for that. It's not that we haven't looked, um, but central Virginia was um, heavily impacted by agriculture, um, primarily before and after the immediately after the Civil War, it famously lost two to three feet of, of soil. Um, so very little of the natural heritage of Central Virginia remains with a few very notable exceptions. But you can see the, the density of, of rare plants, animals, natural communities in Southeast Virginia, and then down the, the spine of the Appalachians, Ridge and Valley. So the preserve system, when I was first hired, there were 24 preserves. Um, in 1989, shortly after that Natural Area Preserves Act, there were six um, preserves that were, were dedicated. By 1999, the number was up to 24. We're now up to 66. This map is slightly out of date. And these are our work areas. Um, I'm in the Abingdon office <clears throat> right here, managed preserves in Southwest Virginia. If Mary Rhodes is still on the call, she might be uh, disappointed to know that uh, the Buffalo Mountain and the Floyd County preserves are no longer part of the Southwest region. Those are managed out of our Roanoke office. Um, but this is what we call our mountain region. Even though uh, Southwest Virginia has higher mountains than the mountain region, that's Nonetheless, this is our mountain region, and then this is our uh, Shenandoah Valley region. Northern Virginia, uh, Chesapeake Bay region, and then we have a, a coastal uh, eastern shore region and southeast Virginia. The blue dots indicate those preserves that have public access facilities. So, for example, if you may be familiar with the channels, number 53. And then the Pinnacle, number three, and Cleveland Barrens in Russell County all have public access facilities. So as I mentioned, what, what are the preserves for? What's the primary management objective? And it's to protect the habitat in perpetuity for future generations. Um, secondarily is for places for active research and education. And then thirdly, compatible outdoor recreation. Uh, the, the 66 preserves encompass just over 60,000 acres now. And about, like I said, about one third of them. Um, okay, sorry about uh, Of the 66 preserves, 45 are, were purchased and owned by DCR. However, there's 21 others that are owned by other entities. Um, in a few cases, the Nature Conservancy Old Dominion University owns some property that is a natural area preserve. The channels is actually not owned by DCR, it's owned by the Department of Forestry. So there's some there's some, a couple other instances that are owned by private individuals that own some you know, significant biologic sites that were dedicated to state natural area preserves. And then of these 66, 23 have parking areas and trails. Let's see, there is a chat function here. I'd like to try and monitor that. Okay, here we go. I see that. Cool. If y'all have, sorry, I lost my, okay, here we go. So um, what does management look like? How do we divide up and compartmentalize what we do? Well, there's natural areas operations management, and that's kind of the nuts and bolts of owning land. That's painting boundaries, boundary line maintenance, um, gates, road maintenance, trails, kiosks, and so forth. Uh, we have uh, three commissioned law enforcement officers across the state, one here in Abingdon. That's John Hartley right there, my coworker here in Abingdon. 
He's a commissioned law enforcement officer. Let's see, that's the, this is actually uh, Buffalo Mountain in Floyd County, which is out of the, my Southwest region. But then here's the pinnacle. That's operations management. Let's see here. Biological resource management be the second, the second area. Um, and that consists of everything from invasive species control to uh, biological monitoring. In some cases, we do timber harvesting when um, removing timber is part of um, an active restoration plan. I'll give some examples of that here in a little bit. Um, the bottom right picture was, uh, this is a researcher from Virginia Tech who, this is photo is probably about 10 or 15 years old, but they released the Laracobius nigrinus, a predatory beetle that feeds on the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and that was at the Pinnacle Natural Area Preserve. And then a topic that I like to talk about, but I'll try not to talk about too much, is prescribed fire management. Uh, many of Virginia's plants, animals, and natural communities are fire adapted, and in some cases, even fire dependent. This picture here was at a, um, a, shen, a little postage stamp remnant of a Shenandoah Valley tall grass prairie um, and wetland community up in Augusta County called Calbane Prairie Preserve. So prescribed fire management, some examples of fire dependent species in Virginia would be a big one is the longleaf pine. Uh, natural heritage has kind of been at the forefront of restoring the Virginia genotype longleaf pine in Southeast Virginia. Um, Table Mountain Pine is uh, known to be fire dependent in that the cones don't open without the heat of a passing fire. And that the, like many pines, they depend on bare mineral soil to germinate. Um, this is an orchid and I'm gonna try and remember the name of it in Southeast Virginia, pale grass pink. Um, this is in Isle of Wight County. It hadn't been seen since the 1920s. Um, and after some um, prescribed fires were implemented in the early 1990s, this species returned to that site. It had been dormant in the, in the seed bank, in the soil for all those decades. Uh, this power line right of way here, this is at Grassy Hill Natural Area Preserve in Franklin County. And about the only thing grassy on Grassy Hill is the power line right of way. So here's a case where the power line and the right of way maintenance over time maintained what was a Piedmont Blue Ridge Foothills uh, prairie system. And these are all um, Echinacea levigata, smooth cone flower, federally endangered. That's the largest population of smooth cone flower in the state of Virginia right there. Um, at that site, we're using timber management to, to open up the adjacent woodlands, um, actually not woodlands, but quite dense forest, and allow that uh, right-of-way habitat to expand into the adjacent area. Now, the species bottom right is the um, Peters Mountain Mallow. For a long time, that was kind of considered the poster child of fire-dependent species in Virginia. It's on a Nature Conservancy preserve in Giles County, up near, um, right above the New River, near the Glen Lynn Power Plant. <clears throat> Excuse me. Near, it's also near the Appalachian Trail. But Peter's Mountain Mallow, it's a mallow. It's a, it's a, a biannual, I think, if I remember correctly. But anyway, this it's the only known location for that plant in the world. Um, and the, the numbers by the early 90s had dropped to you know, less than 20 individuals. Some research was done and it was determined that the, the mechanism, the strategy <clears throat> for that species, for, for the seed to be scarified in order to germinate, requires the heat of a low intensity passing surface fire. Really fascinating. Um, you know, black cherry has to be scarified in the in the belly of a bird and other species have different scarification strategies. This one is completely dependent on the passage of a surface fire. So some small test burns were done with, with very good success and 
over the years, they've expanded that burn unit to, to maybe 12 acres. And the plants are numbered now in the hundreds or thousands. Here's some more pictures of uh, prescribed fire. That's at um, Douthat State Park, upper left. And this is Difficult Creek in Halifax County. And this is actually in Grayson County um, at Big Spring Bog Natural Area Preserve. So enough about fire. Um, we also do a fair amount, like I'm doing this evening, of outreach and education. Because it's critically important to engage the public in what we do and get the public you know, aware of these sites and garner their support and appreciation for, for, the, for natural heritage. Um, it pays dividends. When the General Assembly goes into session like they did yesterday, um, public support is extremely important. That's actually, that's Chris Ludwig right there, uh, Dick. Um, he's our former chief biologist uh, who's gotten involved in the Wild Ones organization. So starting from, uh, from east to west across the Southwest region, I was gonna just do a snapshot and give you some examples of um, the habitats and the plants that are found um, on these natural area preserves. Big Spring Bog is one of the first uh, preserves that was dedicated um, shortly after the Natural Area Preserves Act of 1989. It's a um, small 50 acre preserve that has a core habitat of about four acres of extremely diverse and unusual vegetation. Um, the community type is known as a mafic thin. It's a mafic wetland, mafic meaning high in magnesium and iron, um, low pH, harsh growing conditions that a lot of plants aren't adapted to um, survive in. The yellow flower is the short leaf sneezeweed. That's the tuberous grass pink orchid. Uh, what else is in there? You can see some alder. There's some Canada Burnett right there. Anyway, it's a fascinating place. And it's one we've done a lot of active management in uh, for about the past 20 years. So it's the only site in the state for uh, death camas, Pine Barrens death camas. The G4S1, G3S2 that you see across the bottom, that's natural heritage ranking um, nomenclature. And it stands for the global rank and the state rank. And that's on a scale of one to six. Um, one being the most rare, found at fewer than five sites. Um, so something that's G5S1 is something that's globally you know, common, but very, very unusual in the state of Virginia. Gray's lily is found at Big Spring Bog, and there's the, uh, that's not scarlet Indian paintbrush. That's a typo, that's a significant typo. That's uh, the short leaf sneezeweed, um, Helenium brevifolium. Here's the tuberous grass pink with the Canada Burnett in the background. And large leaf grass of Parnassus. And any of y'all uh, volunteer at the Nature Conservancy's Barn Chapel Swamp Workday on Saturday, that site also supports large leaf grass of Parnassus. So here's a, some photo monitoring from 2003 through 2016 that's showing the effects of a combination of mechanical removal of woody plants. Um, and prescribed fire both. Um, by the early 2000s, Big Spring Bog had been encroached by a lot of white pine, red maple, multiflora rose, greenbrier, um, what was once a, a very open um, habitat had closed in. And that's, that's a pretty common story throughout North America, particularly in Eastern North America, of open habitats that in the absence of management or some kind of disturbance rapidly close in. So you can see over that 13 year period here, I think that 
um, you know, that's, that's mechanical treatment and I believe three prescribed burns. So there's, there's some example that that's me a long, long time ago and uh, examples of mechanical felling trees, girdling trees. Um, another thing that's interesting about the woody encroachment into these systems is how much water is removed from the wetland when you have all these thirsty woody stems that invade the, the wetland. Um, you know, white pines transpire a tremendous amount of water, as does red maple. So when they get a foothold, they slowly dry a place out. Um, so by removing a degree of that woody encroachment, you're re-watering, I don't know if that's the right word. It's the opposite of dewatering, but you're making the, the site wetter. And in this case, that's to the advantage of many of the rare plants. We did a lot of invasive species control there. Um, so we started off, um, this is a Virginia Tech crew years ago, removing multiflora rose. Well, then Japanese stilt grass kind of entered the picture. Um, and then lately, our worst offender is Oriental Bittersweet. You've probably seen that everywhere, but it really thrives in the Blue Ridge, in Blue Ridge soils. That's David Reichert. For those of y'all who might remember David, uh, he works as a forestry consultant up in Blacksburg now. And here's some photos of uh, prescribed fire management at Big Spring Bog. And then just up the road from Big Spring is Grayson Glades Natural Area Preserve. It's 70, 74 acres, I believe. Um, right behind, right off the picture here is the um, Fairview Elementary School, We're right behind the elementary school. Um, this site is much more open, at least this portion of the property is more open because it had recent cattle grazing prior to DCR acquisition. Uh, this photo was taken in the growing season after a prescribed fire, I think in 2016. But all this stuff flowering in the foreground is Queen of the Prairie, which is a, definitely a prairie indicator, much more common to prairie systems in the Midwest, but it's found at a number of sites uh, in, in Virginia. There's a photo from, I think that might have been 2019. We've, we've burned there twice. And this has many of the same species as Big Spring Bog, but more so. Um, there are 27 rare plants that grow in this wetland. It, it may be the highest density of rare plants per unit area that I'm aware of anywhere in the state. Um, but again, the tuberous grass pink orchid, queen of the prairie, Canada burnet, the sticky false asphodel, that's a lily, um, G5S1, that's the only known site for that plant in the state of Virginia. The Virginia least trillium, and I don't have anything for scale here, but it's least Trillium, it's the most diminutive little tiny teensy trillium you've ever seen, but um, it's a G3, T2, and I'd have to actually go back and look at our ranking criteria, what the T2, I can't remember what that means, but anyway, G3, S2. It's also a site for round leaf sundew, carnivorous, um, carnivorous bog plant. So leaving Grayson County behind, moving over towards Smith County on Clinch Mountain is Red Rock Mountain um, Natural Area Preserve. Take an Indian woman off a reservation without a civil ceremony. What's the difference if they're both happy about it? What are you trying to do? Tell me that he's holding her against her will or anything? I think I can mute him. There we go. Does that work? Okay. Red Rock Mountain is just over 600 acres in Smith County above the town of Allison Gap. It's above Saltville. 
if you're going from Chilhowie over to Saltville, there's that beautiful pull off there where you can overlook the whole valley. Um, Red Rock is kind of framed off um, in the background. Red Rock Mountain is a very unusual cove. The cove adjacent is nothing like it, and the cove to the other side is nothing like it. But this is a photograph here of myself, and that's Steve Lindemann, who recently retired from the Nature Conservancy. And that's Colleen Davenport Taylor. She um, grew up in, on Red Rock Mountain in Robertson Cove here. There's Colleen again, and this is Facelia fimbriata the fringe scorpion weed. Um, Colleen doesn't call it Facelia fimbriata, she calls it snowflower. And for good, for obvious reasons there, um, in the early spring, about second week of April or so, before anything in the overstory has leafed out, this, um, it's a biannual, um, blooms by the millions and it, it looks like it has snowed on the ground. So that's a close up there of the fringed, white fringe phacelia, fringe scorpion weed, I've also heard it called. Wild hyacinth is also found up on uh, red rock. You can see a lot of uh, fringe phacelia up on white top mountain. There's a lot of it on white top um, and also on the clinch mountain wildlife management area. That's a photo there that uh, Doug Ogle took from the top of Red Rock Cliffs, looking off toward the town of Saltville. Actually, that's pro yeah, that's Saltville. Allison Gap would be down here. So shifting west to Russell County is the Pinnacle Natural Area Preserve. Uh, I think it's about 900 acres now. Um, double check that. It has more access or more infrastructure than your average natural area preserve. And there's kind of a reason for that, a history that um, the core property of the Pinnacle, which was brought to the attention of the Nature Conservancy by Doug Ogle, former professor at Virginia Highlands Community College. Doug also discovered Big Spring Bog. He also discovered Grayson Glades. Well, back in the late 80s, he brought, or mid 80s, he brought the pinnacle or the core 50 acre tract of the pinnacle, which used to be a Russell County Park. He brought that to the attention of the Nature Conservancy because so many of the unusual plants that grow there. It was later um, given to TNC by Russell County. And since then it was transferred to DCR and DCR has grown it out to I think it's about 900 acres, I'll have to double check that. But we have a, about a 20 car parking lot, um, six miles of trail, and it's on Big Cedar Creek, right before Big Cedar Creek uh, dumps into the Clinch River. It's a major, major tributary to the Clinch. I was wrong, 1,147 acres. Um, we have picnic tables, a swinging bridge, uh, there's a porta potty at the entrance. Actually, this old pit toilet, we demolished that last year. That's no longer there. But very active place. You get a lot of different kind of user groups there from Boy Scouts and Master Naturalists. The, the town of Cleveland uh, Volunteer Fire Department hosts an event every spring. Um, it gets a lot of use. That's Big Falls, one of the kind of attractions at the Pinnacle. Uh, Big Falls with the red bud in bloom. You can see some northern white cedar right there growing along the creek. Right here as well, uh, northern white cedar. What is, okay, I just looked at the chat. I'm sorry, I haven't kept up with that. Um, what is the difference between a forest and a woodland? That's a good question. Um, woodlands tend to have a much more open character, a lower basal area of trees, um, more sunlight hitting the forest floor. Uh, forest tends to be much more closed in, 
you know, 80 to 95% canopy cover versus a woodland has a much more open nature. So if you think about a savanna, which is very open, that's basically a grassland with a few trees scattered across it. A woodland falls in the middle somewhere between the continuum between savanna and, you know, going over toward forest, if that answers that question accurately. But um, you know, woodlands used to be much more common in Virginia. Woodlands and savannas both used to be much more common in Virginia, um, but for various reasons, uh, lack of fire being one of them, um, that's a, an unusual habitat today. I'll close that out, okay. So here's some rare plants at the pinnacle. I don't have these labeled, but this is the American harebell, which actually grows on the pinnacle rock itself, the spotted mandarin. Um, yellow lady slipper. And here's a mix of glade spurge. That's the little, you can kind of, that's, that's in flower right there with a background of thousands of trillium. And then the Carolina carry saxifrage that grows along the cliffs along the river. Super diverse limestone uh, vegetation. And then not to mention, the Clinch River has the highest number of imperiled aquatic species of any river in the country. Sometimes you'll hear it's the most biodiverse river in the country. That's not true. Um, it has the highest number of threatened and endangered species. The Duck River in Tennessee is actually the most biodiverse. It has the highest number of organisms. <clears throat> but the Clinch is, you know, kind of renowned in North America for its uh, biodiversity. Just downstream from on the clinch in the town of Cleveland, this is one that we opened for public access, <coughs> excuse me, in 2017. The, most of the acreage was protected back in the early 2000s, but it wasn't open for public access until just a few years ago. But we partnered with the town of Cleveland and just beyond the, uh, the Baptist church that sits up on top of the hill, the red roof in Cleveland, you descend down here. This is town of Cleveland property to a five car parking area. We have a handicap trail um, that goes from that parking area, a very short distance up to the base of Tank Hollow Falls. Let me ask you all a question. Um, are you all seeing the little windows here, the, the people windows? I'm gonna move you. Do you see that? Okay, good. It's like the Hollywood squares of Zoom. I'm, I'm just getting that out of my way. Make sure y'all can see. So the, the handicapped accessible trail goes right to the base of the waterfall. I can't think of any waterfall in Virginia that somebody with mobility issue could get that close to. But then jumping off of the handicap trail is a pretty arduous hiking trail. It goes up this rock staircase and then climbs up over here and it's a three mile loop up around one of the barrens. And the barrens are open prairie remnants. Well, there's a picture of the trail system, but let's see here. This is what one of the barrens looks like. It looks like a little piece of uh, Missouri prairie turned up on end on a very, very steep slope South, southwest to west facing slopes. So between Carterton, or between uh, Cleveland downstream to Carterton, there's a number of these river knobs underlaid by something called the Elbrook Dolomite Formation. And on just about every one of those knobs is a remnant prairie. Barrens is the vernacular that the uh, community ecologists use. But really fascinating places with Indian grass and big blue stem, side oats, gamma grass, Indian paintbrush, and a whole slew of rare species, rare to Virginia, but fairly common in the Midwest. Here's some examples of those, the hairy rock cress, 
Again, notice it's G5S1, globally common, extremely rare in Virginia. Here's the Great Plains Ladies Tresses, orchid. Um, I believe this is the only known location for that species in the state. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. And then very photogenic Indian paintbrush, kind of a classic prairie, Midwestern prairie species. Pitcher's stitchwort, the minuardia, and then a Midwestern blazing star in abundance about mid-July. <clears throat> and then on the north and east facing sides of these knobs are some of the richest woods you'll find anywhere in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, our natural heritage community ecologists have been working for years doing vegetation plots throughout the state. They've literally built up a, a, a collection of plot data from over 4,000 plots in Virginia. The most biodiverse, like the highest number of vascular plants in their, I think they're 400 meter square plots. Um, yeah, 20 by 20 meters. Um, the one that had the highest diversity was up in the Potomac River Gorge. The second most diverse uh, plot in terms of vascular plants was the plot here where I'm standing. The third most diverse plot in the state was over at Pinnacle. So pretty remarkable diversity outside our doorstep. So moving back up on Clinch Mountain, uh, this is the Channels Natural Area Preserve in Washington County. It laps over into Russell just a little bit. Uh, it's a really unique um, geologic formation of this uh, eroded and carved uh, sandstone cap rock on, on top of Clinch Mountain. The protection of this property has a, a very fascinating story. You could do a whole presentation on it, but it was privately owned for, for a long time. Very few people knew that the channels were even there. They're right below the Hyder's Knob Fire Tower. Um, it was subject to possible development. Actually, before that, there was a mining company that wanted to mine the channels for the high quality quartz uh, to make glass. But I guess the cost of getting that off the top of the mountain was prohibitive, so they never mined it, which was good. Um, and then later, there was a development threat up at the channels. Um, a developer, I believe, from North Carolina wanted to build a complex of ridgetop you know, condos and homes. That was fought in the Board of Supervisor um, by what became a pretty large grassroots movement to save the channels. Some folks like Doug Ogle refer to this as the crevices, but um, I won't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, but this is what it looks like down below. It's just a fascinating set of formations. Heard, heard it referred to as an Appalachian Slit Rock Canyon. Um, someone I know referred to it, they said if, it's like caving with a skylight. So if you don't like caving because you're claustrophobic or whatnot, um, this is maybe the next best thing. It's kind of like caving, but you have some sunlight that pilfers through. In 2000, it was dedicated as a state natural area in 2000, uh, 2008. In 2014, it hit the front cover of the Virginia Tourism Magazine, unbeknownst to DCR. Um, we've been playing catch up um, ever since as far as trying to get a handle and effectively manage it sustainably for future generations. But it's, as you all know, it's a super popular site um, and then when COVID hit, it only, it only got more so. Some more beautiful photos of the channels. And here's a shot from the top looking to the Northeast. So when, when COVID hit, 
Um, you know, the Appalachian Trail closed, the Virginia Creeper Trail closed, um, most of the public lands in the area closed. DCR lands didn't close and they got quite uh, inundated with visitors. The COVID outdoorsmen, I fondly referred to them at, at the time, but um, I thought I had, let's see here. There might've been another set of photos, here we go. So it used to be, you could drive up to the top of Highway 80 and just kind of park anywhere you could find a spot and hike up. Um, we have now limited that parking to a 10 car maximum. Um, there, we've worked with VDOT and they put up no parking signs in the adjacent road shoulders. And then we cordoned off the overlook um, because we had some uh, graffiti and trash and things that were happening out here on top of the rocks that was, you know, really negatively impacting the vegetation on top of the rocks and the, the lichens and everything else, as you can imagine. I think I have another photo here. Um, I'm not sure why that's not working. Well, there's another photo that's supposed to pop up there. On the last Saturday of March, 2020, there were over 72 cars parked across the top of Highway 80, uh, two of which were just left actually in the road. Uh, but that's the kind of visitation that the channels were receiving. And then shortly after that, in mid-April, we closed the channels and implemented these changes, put in the parking area and, and the restrictions. But, you know, 72 cars, that, that amounts to, you know, there, there were several hundred people up in the channels at that given moment. Um, hardly a natural area's experience. So by and large, people have been supportive of the limit on parking. Um, it, you know, tries to, to maintain access for the public, but at the same time, do it in a sustainable way and gives people the, the, the experience of a, a natural area's experience and, and not an overcrowded experience. Okay, moving on west to uh, Lee County in the Cedars. The Cedars is one of the little biodiversity hotspot of, of the state of Virginia. About 2% of the state's biodiversity, so rare plants, animals, natural communities, 2%, which doesn't seem like a big number, but 2% of the state's biodiversity is found within this about six mile area right here, just west of the town of Jonesville. So these are rare terrestrial species, aquatic species in the PAL and tributaries, and then a whole underground karst system that supports rare bats and rare, um, uh, rare, all kinds of rare animals. It's a patchwork puzzle in, in progress. Um, when I first started, there were only two pieces of property in the Cedars, there's now over 30. My forward buttons aren't working anymore. Let's try this, here we go. Well, there's an ex example of some of that. Um, here's the a false aloe. Again, I think that's a G5S1. Um, it's the, here's a G1S1. That's the um, running glade clover that's only known in abundance in the cedars, and then one small area in Middle Tennessee. Um, and then here's an example of the sinking stream. That's Beatty Creek sinking. It has some limestone, um, limestone dolomite uh, prairie openings. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Here you go. Um, diverse salamander populations underground. The whole, the whole area, it's the Hurricane Bridge limestone, is just, 
just a Swiss cheese of karst caves um, and sinking streams. Upper left is the Lee County Cave Isopod, which was, uh, I believe, first identified and new to science in the mid 1980s. It was almost simultaneously being threatened to extinction by some water pollution in the area. And a lot of our land acquisition has focused on um, maintaining and enhancing habitat for that Lee County Cave isopod. It's an eyeless, pigment-free amphipod, about the size of a grain of rice. I won't read all of this, but um, mainly just look here, 32 rare plant and animal species. 13 of the 16 rare animals are cave dwelling species. Very important bat habitat and uh, the hydrology underneath the cedars is a major tributary to the Powell River, which has 15 federally listed aquatic species, mussels and fish. So here's an example of a limestone dolomite barren or prairie opening um, in very, very thin soils. Um, these are a target for future fire management. And some current, I'll have a couple of pictures of that here in a minute. Again, this is kind of like Cleveland Barrens in that it's a little glimpse of Midwestern prairies that once extended into Western Virginia and all the way into Central Virginia for that matter. Um, it's a land of, like I said, sinking streams and karst. This is what we call the karst window that um, it's probably an underground stream that several thousand years ago, the roof collapsed to give passerbys. This is Gary, this is Russell Road right up here. Um, about a 150 foot glimpse of the underground stream. And this is a view in Thompson Cedar. No, not Thompson Cedar. This is a Surgener Cave in the Cedars. Uh, that's our former DCR director, Clyde Christman. So here's an example, again, of some habitat management work to improve, restore um, habitat conditions that we know were once at this location. In the absence of management, in the absence of grazing, in the absence of fire, it grew up just dog hair thick in Eastern Red Cedar and Virginia Pine and some other things. So starting about 2015, we opened this mechanically and then did a contract at a forestry mulcher to mulch the area, to mulch some of this um, standing woody stems and then follow that up with two prescribed fires. And that was a picture I think from last summer. So that's the exact location on the ground. And those pictures were taken six years apart. It's just amazing the response that if you take the management action, um, the species that they we knew they were here, we had records from the early uh, 80s of a botanist who came through and documented a number of rare species here. He documented a much more open condition. Um, and some of, some of you could still see like basil leaves, you could still see a little remnant of what uh, was asleep, I guess you might say. And then we woke it up. I thought I had some other, I think I have some in, embedded photos in this that aren't showing properly, but that's okay. So the remaining structure here is a um, combination of post oak, which is a fire tolerant oak, very almost fire adapted, uh, blackjack oak, some white oak. Um, we left a few of the cedars. I think, you know, they, they weren't absent on the landscape, that's for sure. Um, it's one of the few locations in the state for um, rattlesnake master, Eryngium yucca folium. Again, a very common Midwestern prairie indicator plant. 
but very rare in Virginia. And then we have a very active outreach program, volunteer program in the, in the Cedars, uh, primarily thanks to Laura Young, who's our Southwest uh, Region Steward, and her, her, her role is mostly the management of the preserves in Lee County. But she's cultivated a, a really robust volunteer program. Um, they come up with an annual calendar of events. I'll share that with you, Dick, and you can spread it around, but they do float trips. Um, stargazing, geology hikes, uh, bird hikes, um, a lot of work days for like sinkhole cleanups and things of that nature. And then lastly, I just closed with this quote from Aldo Leopold. And this is a photo of the Clinch River taken at the Nash Ford Bridge, looking upstream at what we call the Underwood Cliff. Um, and this was the most recent um, acquisition inclusion into the Pinnacle Natural Area Preserve. It's a piece that um, the Nature Conservancy purchased and transferred to DCR uh, about two years ago. That's, yeah, with that, I'll take some questions. I think I was right about one hour or just under, so that's not too bad. Well, thank you very much, Claiborne. Um, just in watching the photos, it would take us years to accumulate and see all those if we were to tour around and uh, visit all the, the na uh, natural areas. So it's uh, to see them all in one time period, one hour, is just amazing. Um, but uh, are there some, uh, some questions that uh, folks would like to ask? Yeah, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask a question or put it in the chat box. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is just thank you for your tolerance for technical problems at the beginning. Uh, fortunately, I don't know what I did to cause the problem. I don't know what I did to uh, remedy it, but uh, it worked out. So uh, thanks for your uh, uh, patience there. But uh, there's a question here. Uh, yeah, somebody says, not, not a question, but I can't wait to get up there and see some white cedar. Uh, yeah, northern white cedar is one of my favorite species. So it, it, um, it looks like the um, horticultural arborvitae. Um, it looks like eastern red cedar if you took a, a, an iron and flattened the, the needles. Um, but it has a really interesting range. If you look at the range map, North American range map of uh, northern white cedar. It's mostly up in, somebody says super rare in Tennessee. That's true. Um, it's mostly up in the lake states in Canada in bog settings. And then there's a little blip of it in southwest Virginia, northeast Tennessee, and nothing in between. Um, just an interesting uh, occurrence. And northern white cedar is actually a true cedar. You know, eastern red cedar is not a cedar. Um, it's a juniper, Juniperus virginiana. Um, that's why red cedar, eastern red cedar, the red and cedar are combined into one word, indicating that it's not its true name. Uh, northern white cedar is a, is a true cedar, like western red cedar. Okay, someone says here, um, with heavy water usage of various trees, have you noticed the expansion of grasses benefiting spring flow? Creating pathways through the soil to spring caverns. Um, I don't know if I've seen that, but I've definitely noticed that areas that we have reduced the tree cover in wetland settings that were encroached wetlands, when you reduced, reduced the woody encroachment, the, the invading trees, the site becomes wetter. And then thus, when it's wetter, it's less prone to invasion. It slows down that phenomena taking place because white pine, they really don't like to have their feet that wet. Um, but over time, 
whether it's starting off with you know shrub invasion and red maple and things of that nature, um, it'll get dry enough where it can tolerate it. Um, and then they do become more herbaceous, so more grassy, more higher density of forbs and grasses. Were the historic prairies in Virginia a stable system or only a temporary product of fire? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there's a book that would answer that question in far more depth than I can do right now. And it's called Forgotten Grasslands of the South. The author's name is escaping me at the moment, but uh, look up that book, Forgotten Grasslands of the South. Native Americans had a huge population in North America, especially Eastern North America, going back. The number keeps going back far farther, but 10 to 15,000 years ago. And they undoubtedly had a huge impact on the landscape. That said, some of these adaptations that these species developed would have taken, as far as we understand, would have taken even longer than that to develop. So fire was on the landscape prior to um, that Native American population. But the Native Americans definitely had a, a extreme influence um, on the landscape, you know, from the mountains to the to the sea. Do you have a favorite location? Uh, of all these places I just mentioned, I, I can't say that one's my favorite. <laughs> uh, the Cedars has kind of the trifecta, I like to say, of, you know, it's, it's got so much terrestrial diversity, aquatic diversity, and then a whole universe of karst cave. And so there's not too many places that have that three-dimensional biodiversity that the Cedars has. Uh, can you describe how you perform a burn? Also, how would you say the seeds were, how old would you say the seeds were that became the flowering plants at your burn sites? Um, that's hard to say. Some of it could have been from seed in the seed bank. Some of it could have been from, you know, remnant uh, plant material, dormant root systems, um, rhizomes, things of that nature that get triggered by increased light levels and, and higher nutrient levels following a fire. Um, how we perform a burn is we, we delineate, there's a lot of planning that goes into it and the burn is a pretty short duration. Um, but we you know, delineate an area, we write a plan that specifies very specific environmental parameters, everything from relative humidity and wind speed and wind direction to atmospheric stability, instability, um, fuel moisture and so forth. And then we, if, if necessary, we create fire breaks where there are none. We try and use natural fire breaks uh, but then once that once the fire breaks are in place and the given area is delineated, we start downwind and pull and pull fire, create a black line, and, and then starting from that anchor point downwind, um, move upwind with with the firing. Uh, if you want to visit the channels, how can I be sure there'll be a parking spot? Unfortunately, you can't be sure. Um, I would like to remedy that situation. We've had some internal discussions about putting up a, a cellular camera um, that would show the public the parking area so you would know before you drove up there if there's a parking spot. Uh, but by and large, I tell people, don't go on Saturday or Sunday. Try and go midweek. Um, if, you, if you're gonna go on the weekend, get there early before 9 a.m. Um, on your pretty spring, fall weekends, the parking lot typically fills up by, you know, 9 or 10 a.m. When the days are longer in the summer, you can also kind of arrive when a lot of people are leaving. So if you arrive mid-afternoon, you still have plenty of daylight to hike up to the channels and back. Um, if you get there and there are no parking spaces, then 
and on busy weekends, we try and staff the parking area with a, a wage person that we have that works up there. And he'll direct people to the Pinnacle and over to Cleveland Barrens and give them some alternative sites to go to. Um, it doesn't, yeah, we've run into some problems with people who get there and they're quite upset because there's not a parking space. Um, but by and large, people have been pretty understanding of it. I know some other state natural areas um, in more populated areas. I've seen this in, in, in Colorado and out in Washington state where you actually have to go online and reserve your spot. Often you have to pay for it. That's another thing I didn't mention. All these preserves, the public access in Virginia is free. Um, I can't say how much longer it'll be that way, but it's currently has been. Uh, there is no entry charge. Um, but in, in Colorado and in Washington, you have to reserve your parking space, you know, print off something and put it on your dash. Um, but we're not that advanced yet in Virginia. Yeah, Forgotten Grasslands of the South. And I'll remember that author's name, like right when we sign off. Reed Noss, yes, thank you, Ken Moore. Reed F. Noss, he's a brilliant naturalist, writer, um, historian. And it's, it's an interesting um, book from a naturalist standpoint. It's also a really interesting book from just a, a human history, cultural history standpoint. <laughs> Lavonda Heath, tell David Reichert to call me. I will, I will do that. Uh, I try and keep in touch with him. Does poor mountain have rare species in addition to the pirate bush? I am not sure. Um, not to my knowledge, but don't quote me on it. Um, the, the pirate bush is, is the most well-known Poor Mountain has the largest population of um, pirate bush, which has a symbiotic relationship with um, Table Mountain Pine, but Poor Mountain has the largest population in the world. Could you suggest a priority of visiting the locations? Um, it all kind of depends on the time of year. You know, um, in, in the spring, you, you can't beat the pinnacle. Um, the, the, it's extremely diverse, it's beautiful. Um, a lot of wildflowers, uh, especially like uh, the month of April into the first half of May. Um, but it's really variable. I, I kind of like the channels in the winter time when you can see the bones of the mountains and there's not many people up there. Um, It's outside of my region. I used to manage Buffalo Mountain in Floyd County, but if you haven't been to Buffalo Mountain, make that, put that on your, on your to-do list. That's a beautiful, beautiful place. Super diverse. Um, it's in Southern Floyd County near the town of Willis. Okay, here's somebody. I live near Chestnut Creek Wetlands. Is that gonna be open to the public? What rare species can be found there? Bog turtles, question uh, mark. Chestnut Creek wetlands will probably not uh, ever be open to the public. Um, the, the wetlands that were protected there are, are pretty sensitive to um, you know, trampling and, um, and there are some, there's a, a rare um, federally endangered insect butterfly that lives there, the Mitchell satyr. Um, is found at Chestnut Creek Wetlands. It's right almost in the shadow of Buffalo Mountain. So it's in an area that is pretty well served as far as public access on natural areas. And that's one that, you know, kind of like Big Spring Bog, we're never gonna open that up to the public. Um, trips, however, can be arranged with, with the regional manager. You know, if it's for a, um, a master naturalist group or, or some sort of relevant interest group, um, we can do guided field trips. Uh, and then bog turtles, I, I can't comment on that because bog turtles are, are highly coveted and collected and sold around the world for obscene amounts of money and we don't reveal those locations. 
are there any other questions? Uh, but if not, we'll, uh, well, here's one more and then, then maybe we'll finish up here tonight. Uh, peripheral question to your topic. I'm a Tennessee resident, but I drive 81 a lot. It seems like Virginia is managing the highway median and margins for native plants and pollinators. Am I imagining that? Um, I'm not sure. I think it kind of depends on which VDOT district you're in as to how much of that they do. Um, And it also depends on the time of year. You know, if you drive 81 all the way up through the Roanoke Valley from, from Abingdon, and if you drive it in October or November, you'll see a tremendous amount of Indian grass, just native Indian grass growing along the highway right of way. And again, that's just, it's, uh, that's not something that VDOT planted. Um, that's just remnant plant material uh, in the soil. There's a, a lot of it, especially as you descend down into the Roanoke Valley. There's a lot around Abingdon too. You go, go out White's Mill Road in the fall and you see a lot of Indian grass. Um, there have been some issues of native plants and, and planting for pollinators in medians, because if you attract the pollinators and you're, you're attracting them <clears throat> into high speed, high traffic situations where you might wind up killing a lot of butterflies in the process. Or there was a case on I-64 in Eastern Virginia, and I can't, I can't remember the species. There was a species of shrub that had a delectable berry or something. <clears throat> and it was the site of a, a lot of songbirds were getting hit by passing cars. Um, so that's, kind of the trade-off. I like, I like seeing native plants and pollinator type projects along the sides of the road, but not down the median so much uh, for that reason. Um, but I appreciate everybody's time. It's been really nice. I, I recognize quite a few names on here, so that's pretty cool, um, both people near and far away. So uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Gail and, and Dick. Thank you, Mark Claiborne, and just the rest of you. Uh, this is our website, the Appalachian Highland Wild Ones website, and we will have uh, some wildflower walks. We'll have some tours of gardens in the area. And um, um, so we hope we can show you some native plants um, and talk and help uh, give you resources to develop and put some native plants into your own yard. So thank you for everyone that was part of this. and. Uh, Please, please look at our website. Thank you.